Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. We continue with neural networks, also known as deep learning. Okay, and we jump right to where we were last time. I think we talked about different activation functions and then came the example, but I didn't calculate the derivatives yet, right? I guess that's the right location. So, Let's again look at the multi-layer network that we have here. So it's a bias plus some w times something. And this something is itself some bias plus w times something else. And that something else is yet again another one. And in between are these nonlinearities, in this case the tangent hyperbolicus. So this is just some expression, yeah? And it traditionally has this form that the input is linearly transformed and some threshold is added, and then comes the nonlinearity, and then we repeat that several times. However, the operations that we are doing here, yeah, you could have other operations. For example, the linear mapping could be restricted to be a convolution, and we will talk about that one later. That's just a special case of having a matrix here. Um, the tangent superbolicus could be a relu or some sigmoidal function, so you could also vary that one. And in principle, we could have much more complicated equations here. For example, in transformer models, we are not having linear transformations of the x, but the x could be also nonlinear transformed before um, passed through a component-wise nonlinearity. So in principle, we could have any expression with parameters. Yeah? It doesn't matter whether it has this form or any other form. Yeah? And inventing a new layer, for example, means replacing this linear mapping w2 times something with some other operation, okay, which might have even more parameters. Um, however, let's for now stick to this very simple form, okay? And that is a, um, that is a mathematical description. Um, we can also write code for it. And again, here you see the mathematical expression is just another programming language, okay? So this is a programming language for pieces of paper and pencil. It's usually not compiled, so if you miss a bracket, everyone is happy. Maybe not everyone who doesn't understand the formula, but we are much more tolerant against mistakes. And here's a computer implementation of the same thing. And here you note, we are a bit more verbose here, so we give intermediate results some names. And at this point, it might not be really necessary to do that, but once we calculate parameters, once we want to learn them, these notations will be very useful. So, we have some input layer, and we give it the name Z1. And then we have the first hidden layer, which is the output of like the innermost operation. So this is like a linear regression style operation, and then normalizing against uh, between minus 1 and plus 1 with the tangent superbolicus. And the output, we say, this is the output of the second layer. How I, however, no one stops you from saying this linear operation is the first hidden layer, and my third hidden layer is basically the output of applying the nonlinearity component-wise. So the granularity that you put in here is arbitrary, okay? And it doesn't really matter. Um, this is now kind of useful to us to say, in each layer we have kind of the same operation, okay? But it doesn't have to be like that. In the final layer, we don't have a nonlinearity here because possibly our output might not be mi between minus 1 and plus 1. So maybe we want to have the full range of possibilities. That's why we don't compress it. Then we have some redundancy here. We want to have these nice notations that all the layers in the network are called Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. But the Z1 is the X, and the Z4 is actually the Y, the output of the network. And then our program goes on. And so how do we continue? OK, we calculate the, the error down in the last two lines. So we calculate the residual. Yeah, we compare it with the goal values, which puts the t with the one-hot encoding, for example. And then we calculate basically the error, the squared error of these residuals. And the point 0.5 here is purely technical. If you take derivatives of that one, the point 0.5 will disappear. Right? Otherwise, we would have a 2 that we need to drag around, and we don't want to have that. OK, so this is a nice implementation. And we gave some intermediate results, some names, OK? In particular, we could also see C Z4 now as a function, right? Z4 is a function with parameters B3, W3. 
And actually also, Z4 has also all the other parameters that are in Z3. But they, it depends on what we're talking about. So basically, the output layer has these two parameters. The third layer has the parameters B2 and W2, and so on and so forth. But this is completely arbitrary. In principle, we have any function, y of x, where we have some of the inputs now not written down because they are parameters. And we can do, uh, say, this is a multi-layer network if we have like some complicated structure. And being multi-layer tells us something about the operations here, but not so much, depending on the layer, what we are really using, what a single operation is. The number of layers might vary. OK, now having specified the model with nice computer code, how can we learn the parameters? And for this, we simply calculate the gradients of the error. That's why I put it down here. So the function that I implemented here is a function that goes from x to the error. And we want to minimize the error, so we calculate the derivative of the error with respect to all parameters. And that's what we're going to do next, OK? And we do this with the differential. And since you like calculations on the board, I do it on the board, OK? For that one, let me briefly copy the expressions here that we have, OK? And then um, I will show you how to calculate the differential. So uh, let me put it here. Z1 is x, Z2 is ton h. And then I think it's B1, W1, Z1, fine. So this is now a bit boring, but it will be useful in a second when I do the derivations. And Z4 is no tongue in hyperbolicus, but just the B3. And then next, we had the Y being equal to Z3. OK, great. Then we have the residual, and we also give it a name, and it's y minus our targets. OK, so the, in, the training data is locations x and targets. We have a one-hot encoding. And finally, the error is one-half residual transpose times residual. OK, so this is just summing up all the errors. So far, so good. Um, let's write out the differential. And we want to have the differential, so we want to uh, take the derivative of e with respect to all the parameters. So how do we do it? We do it backwards, OK? We start at the end. So we say we are interested in the differential e. And now you could put some sub-indices here of what variables you are interested in, but we do this more like with the case distinction. So my derivation now is purely mechanical, OK? The first step is I plug in the definition of the E. So I will have D 1 half R transpose R. And here you've seen that several times already. That's like a squared function. It will be D of R times R, and it will be R times dr. And then you can swap it because it's a scalar. So the result will be R transpose dr, OK? So far, so good. Great. So this is the first part now that we computed. So this is the first part of the big derivatives that are going to appear on the screen here, on the, on the board. So let's continue now with that term over here. But let's keep the r in front. Maybe that's useful. So we have the r transpose. And next, we just plug in our definition y minus t. And we are still not at the parameters, right? So we are still trying to push the d deeper into the expression until we have it in front of the b or in front of the w. So <clears throat> here, let's again plug in the expression for the y. Or we could also say the r is, oh, there's a d missing. So the t is constant, right? So this thing just disappears, so it's just dy. OK, great. Let's plug in the expression for the y, which is that 4. OK, it's this one. Great. Next, let's plug in the expression for the z4. OK, so it's, what I'm telling you is this is really very mechanic. It's just pattern, uh, it's not even pattern matching. It's really just term replacement. OK, it's a term replacement scheme. So d of b3 plus w3 times z3. OK, now it gets more interesting, right? Because here's our first parameter. This is another parameter, and the other parameters are inside the Z3. 
So now we need to distinguish three cases. Okay, we could be after the B3, after the W3, or after all the other ones. Okay, so let's start with um, the, the, the gradient of E with respect to B3. Okay, if we are interested in that expression, then basically our DE, our differential of E is equal to this expression where this one now is constant. Okay, so it will be just R transposed db3. So far so good. From this one we can read off the gradient. And I'm, I keep talking about gradients now. Um, those are the derivatives. But gradients have the, have the property that they will have the same shape as the vari variable we are taking the derivative with. So I use this nabla thing, which is the notation for the gradient. And typically, with the nabla, we would write down here the variable with which we take the derivative of. And we can read, read it off from the identification tables, which is the transpose of the r, which is equal to r. So and now the variable down here might be a scalar, a vector, a matrix, a tensor, whatever. Just important, the thing on the other side has exactly the same shape. OK? And the B3 has exactly the same shape as the R. Where can we see that? Um, we can see that the R has the same shape as the Y. Y is the same as Z3, uh, Z4. OK, so that's the first mistake. I did it correctly over there. So, and then the Z4 has the same shape as B3. OK, so everything is fine. So here's our first gradient that we have. Nice. Let's take the next one. So point, point, point with respect to W3. That one is more interesting because it's a matrix. OK, so let's see what's happening. So we have D, E is equal to. Now the first term is constant. And we have the D in front of the W3 times Z3. So we have R transpose times DW3. And I can put brackets around to make it more clear, times Z3. So how do we get a derivative from this one? Any suggestions? Do you have the identification tables in your head? Maybe not yet. So the intuition is always the D term must go to the end, right? However, matrix matrix multiplication, and this is matrix matrix multiplication in a way with two vectors, is non commutative. Okay? However, we can always look at it and look, think about the shape. And the shape here of this one yeah, will have exactly the same shape as the E, right? Because it's a differential of the E. So this is a scalar. Okay? And if it's a scalar, I can put the trace in front of this one. Doesn't matter. And if I put the trace in front of this one, I can rotate the Z3 to the beginning. So this thing is the same as the trace of Z3 times R transpose times DW3. OK? So that was just a simple rule that the trace of two matrices is the trace of the two matrices, also the other way around. That's always a bit surprising, right? However, we assume that the trace is applied to a squared matrix. If it's a squared matrix, this is m by n, uh, m, and the inner dimensions could be different, but the outer dimensions are the same. So it makes sense to move the b to the other side. OK, great. And now looking at the identification table, by the way, this is the same as saying every element of this matrix, which is like a row times a uh, column times a row vector, which is a matrix. It's an outer product of two vectors. Um, every element here gets multiplied with ele every element here, and then you sum everything up. Yeah? So that is the same as saying every element here is multiplied with every element here. No, oh, OK. That's not a good phrasing. Let's rephrase it. So the first element in R gets multiplied with the first element in this vector the second with the second one, the third with the third one, and then we sum everything up. And the same holds for these two matrices. However, one needs to be transposed. Okay? So what we can do now, we can read off, again using the identification table, now the derivative. And in our case, it's, it's nicer to say I'm 
I find the gradient, okay? So I'm having the gradient with respect to W3, because now the object that I write here will have the same shape as W3. However, when you think back in the matrix differential calculus class, the derivative, there was the convention that the derivative will be a long vectorized version of a matrix, which is a bit cumbersome. So here it's nicer to do it the other way around. And I need to transpose it. Okay, so here's my derivative with respect to the matrix W3. So far so good? Okay. So those are now derivatives that I can use for gradient descent. Okay, let's put a box around this one as well. Let's remove that box. How do we get to the other parameters, b2 and w2? For that one, I need to continue with z3. So that's the third case. So that's the gradient with respect to b2, w2, b1, and w1. That's the one that I want to have next. And for that one, I'm saying, so de, again, I'm starting with, with the derivation I had over here. So this looks funny. I will have R transpose, and now I'm saying B3 is constant, W3 is a constant. The B3 just disappears, the W3 I need to keep, right? So that is one of the factors here, and then I have a D Z3. Okay? So far so good? Okay. So, next, okay, there's nothing more we can do with our calculus, then let's plug in our next expression. So the next expression we need to plug in is W3 times D, and this must be B2 plus W2, Z2. Oh, and there's an important detail missing. It's the tangent superbullicus now of this expression. Aha! So this is something new that we haven't seen yet. So how do we do it, deal with that one, right? So for that one, we need a formula or something, right? Because we need to drag in the D somehow, we need to pass it by, okay? Okay, let's continue with the tangent superbolicus first. Let's deal with that one first. Um, do you want to see it on the board, or should I show you some slide with the tangent superbolicus? On the board. Board? Okay, so it has another speed, I know. Okay, then let's do it on the board. And if I fail, I will look into the slides. OK. So basically, what we now need is some nice formula, basically, for our calculus. Suppose we are having tangent superbolicus of a vector. Now, what, are we, how, what expression do we get here, point, 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 to get something like this, right? So we need such a, such a formula. OK, so let's start with something simple. Let's first of all say we have a scalar, OK? So that's easier, OK? So let's say we have a scalar. And then I tell you how to use it to get a vectorized version. So we need a formula for that one that we can deal with, where we can apply our calculus. And the thing is, the tangent superbolicus can be also written as e to the alpha, e to the minus alpha, e to the alpha plus e to the minus alpha. OK, quick check. So let's say alpha goes to infinity. What do we want? We want to have a plus 1, right? So alpha goes to infinity. Those two terms disappear. And this is the 1. Um, alpha goes to minus infinity. Those two terms disappear. We get this divided by that 1, and we get a minus 1. OK, so far, so good. So it looks like the signs are OK. Now we are using the formula that if we have d of two expressions, like this, and we basically get df times g minus f times dg, and the whole thing divided by g squared. So this is just a typical product rule that you know from school. Um, so let's apply that one. OK, so we start with the simple stuff. So the simple stuff is just to copy that one plus squared. OK, great. And now we need to start with the top part here. And for the top part, um, let's first 
learn about what is d e to the alpha? Any suggestions? Yes? Like this? And I need a d alpha somewhere. Almost right. Any other suggestions? Then let me ask the question differently. So what is this? What is the derivative of that one? No, no. That's e to the x. e to the x, the, 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 um, the f this, this number e only exists because of this great property, that it's its own derivative, OK? So here's no alpha. And then it's OK, right? Great. So this is our first formula that we need. What about this one? Now you can, you can recover if you want to. Do you want to tell me? And now I need to think, so is he a minus sign or not? Um, yeah, there's still one, right? OK, great. OK, perfect. So those are the things that I need now, right? Those two formulas. And you see, nobody just writes down the solution right away. You always need your side sheets and make, make sure that you understand what you're talking about. So this is super important to write it down. You see also me writing down things like trace of a times b equals to trace times b times a. I also do it when I do my own derivations. And I write it as a note, not only for you, but to me. When I'm in one year, give the lecture again, right? Then again, I'm struggling. So what was the trick? So derivative of the top part. OK, let's do a few steps in our head. So d e alpha is just e alpha d alpha, great, minus e to the minus alpha, which will be that expression. However, the minus sign and that minus sign, they will cancel out. And then a d alpha. So it will be e to the alpha, and then we get plus e to the minus alpha d alpha, right? Everyone's fine, times the bottom part here. We have everything is scalars, so we can just square it. Was too fast? Yeah, so here I'm getting e to the alpha, here I'm getting e to the minus alpha again, so that is system, but the plus comes from a minus times minus. OK? And then I need to multiply it with the denominator, which happens to be the same term. OK, great. Then comes a minus sign. And let's do the same thing again for the bottom part. And now, actually, I need to write down first this one. OK, let's write it out. So it's e to the alpha minus e to the minus alpha. So the derivative of e to the alpha is e to the alpha. e to the minus alpha will be minus e to the minus alpha. And that's exactly what's here already. So I can also say this is the one squared. It's a bit magic, but OK, that's how it is. Um, so we are almost done. So the d alpha is already at the end. However, let's bring it to a nice form. So we can cancel out that term against that term, right? So we have 1 minus, and then we have e to the alpha minus e to the minus alpha. plus, OK. And can we simplify this further? Any suggestions? Yes? Yes, this is just a tangent superbolico squared. OK, and now we have a nice formula. Tangent superbolicus is equal to that one. So why is it nice? Because when you have a neural network, you always have a forward pass where you calculate everything. You keep all intermediate results. One intermediate result will be this one, tangent superbolicus squared. Then when you do the back propagation, we see a little animation later how this works. Then you can reuse this result. And you just say 1 minus the, the stuff from the forward pass squared. And this is super useful. Um, for the sigmoid function, you can derive something similar. So for the sigmoidal one, which was 
sigma of alpha is 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus alpha? I think so. Oh, yes, very much. It must be inside. OK, thank you. I think this is the sigmoidal one, right? Again, a quick check is e to the 0 will be 1, so 1 divided by 2. So that's why he must be a plus. And for that one, you can also derive the differential in a similar fashion. And it turns out to be 1 minus sigma of alpha d alpha. OK, so that's the one for the sigmoidal function, which is also an interesting result, right? Because when you think of the function, so it says the derivative here at this location is 1 minus the derivative of that value. So it is this interval up here. So that is the derivative at this location. OK, so that's interesting. The other thing is, it's also an interesting property because when you do the forward pass, you calculate the sigma of alpha. And then when you do the backward pass, you can just reuse this value to calculate the derivative. OK, so far so good. Let's get rid of that one. So we answered our first question here. It's 1 minus tangens hyperbolicus of alpha squared d alpha. OK, almost. We now need a vectorized version of that one. OK, vectorized versions, um, that's not so easy always. However, I said the tangent superbolicus is applied component-wise. OK, so let's say we have a vector uh, version. So we say tangent superbolicus of a vector. OK, let's say our vector is alpha 1 to alpha n. OK, so far so good. Then we could say this is the same as d of tangent superbolicus applied to every coordinate. So far so good. Um, that was the first plug-in of a value. The next thing is d of a vector is the same as the vector of d of each of the components. OK, so I can say this is the same as d tangent superbolicus blah. OK, I need more chalk. So please interrupt me at any time if there's something unclear, OK? That's the whole point of doing it on the board. Perfect, I can use my formula. Oh, and then there's a d alpha. OK, here's a d alpha 1. Uh, let's, let's do one step already. So this is like having now a vector times vector, right? So this is just a Hadamard product. So this must have the same shape as that one. And then it just, in, in Python, it would be just this star, OK? Just component-wise. Nice. So from this one, we can go back to that notation. From that one, we can go back to the vectorized notation. So the result will be 1 minus tangent superbolicus of our vector squared component-wise times dv. Okay? Or if you like it more, 1 minus tangent superbolicus Hadamard product with itself. OK, so that's the way we could write it. I will now use in the following this notation here. But be sure that you know how to square a vector. And this, the way to square a vector is like that, OK? Component-wise, in this case. Sometimes a squared could also mean other things for matrices. Yeah? In this case, I really mean this one. 
OK, great. Now we have a formula that we can use. So we can apply it over there. So it will be R transpose W3. And now comes 1 minus tangens hyperbolicus squared. OK, we have a name for that one, right? So that is 1 minus Z3. Z3 was exactly the tangent superbolicus of this expression. So let's use this name. And now you see that giving these intermediate results names is nice, right? Because the formulas get shorter. And then behind, I have the D of the rest. So far, so good. So we came over the hurdle here. Now the next step is blah, blah, blah with respect to B2. And now we are already experts, right? So we see DE is equal to this, 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 this. This thing is constant. So let's, re let's read off the gradient immediately. Anyone can tell me what the gradient is? There's one subtlety. So here's the expression. You just need to transpose it. You tell me? Uh, transpose. Oh, very true. What's that? W3 transpose? Great. I'm, I'm glad that I asked one of you. I think in my slides I forgot that one. OK. I will put it in. OK, great. Yeah, makes sense, right? Because this is a column vector, and it must be a row vector times a matrix times a column vector. And then it's a scalar, right? Then this thing will be a scalar, which is the same shape as E. OK. Ah, but ah, there's something fishy here. Um, no, it's, hmm. So what's going on? There must be somewhere some mistake. So the mistake must be already up here. Maybe it's down here. Ah, OK. So there's some mistake here. because So here's already the type error. So I didn't forget the transpose. That's good. But OK, another advantage of doing it on the board, then you really have to rethink everything. But you make mistakes. So the problem is already here. So this is rho times the matrix times the column vector, and then times the column vector, right? So here's a size mismatch. So there's something wrong. OK, so there must be already been some mistake in my derivation. Luckily, it's still there. So, ah, here's the mistake. So here we have Adama product. And we don't have a vector. So this was already vector times vector, which was wrong. Yeah? And similarly, here we need. Hadamard product, OK? That is quite unfortunate. So how can we, we, we shuffle this, OK? So let's take two vectors, A times B. And we need, to we, we need to rewrite it in such a way that we are using the usual matrix matrix multiplication. Yes? Yes, very good. So diagonal matrix of A. And here I'm using a capital D saying this will be a matrix, right? And when I use diag, then I'm using the, I want to have the diagonal. So times b. OK, so that's the trick. Great. So let's put, let's squeeze here some diag in here. And then this gets times. And here, similarly, we have a diag in here. And this thing gets times. OK, so mechanically, we also plug in the diag over here, but maybe we should uh, rewrite it. So this will be diag 1 minus uh, Z3. I think it was Z3 squared. So now we have a row vector times matrix times a matrix times a vector, Okay, which is a scalar.
Okay, and now we can say for with respect to B2, and now I do it for you. So now it's diag of 1 minus z3 squared times w3 transpose times r. The reason why the w3 transpose is so important here, often the w is a rectangular matrix, right? Because it kind of translates the shape of the third layer, which might have been 1,000 hidden nodes, into 10 hidden nodes, uh, 10 output layer nodes. So it might be a 10 by 1,000 matrix. And in this case, I'm kind of doing everything reverse, so also the matrix gets reversed. Fifth one, with respect to W2. <coughs> so any suggestions for that one? Can you do it in your head? So you have to use this part here, and somehow need to plug the Z2 also to our expression. Yes, there is. Ah, oh, perfect. So it's getting better and better. Great. <laughs> and we will check the slides for these kind of mistakes. Um, so any suggestions for that expression? And as you, can, as you see, if you fail, it's probably due to earlier mistakes I made. So let's think about it. So it must be this part the other way around, right? But before we do that, we will say, OK, this is a scalar. So we put a trace in front of it. And so the trace will rotate the z2 to the beginning here. OK, so it will be diag of 1 minus z3 squared, and then not a w3, oh, then a w3 transpose times r times z3, z, z2 transpose. OK. So far, so good. And now the ultimate challenge. Can you read it off? So let's think about what's happening here. So we're starting with the differential of E. And kind of we're going backwards with the computation, right? So this is like the first, the last step. This was like the second last step. This was the tongue and superbolicus. And here comes the remaining steps. And we are kind of putting them all in a row. This is just like the chain rule, right? We're just multiplying different local derivatives. And we will have it spelled out on the slides in a second. So basically, we need to put all these terms in here but backwards. So we start from the back. It's R transpose, W3 transpose, right? And then comes the terms that we already have, diag of 1 minus Z3 squared, OK? So far, it's just the same as that one. But now, um, we will get, for the Z2, we get another W2 here. So we will have a W2 transpose. And then we get another diag. I need a bit more space. 1 minus z2 squared, coming from the tangent superbolicus. Seems plausible, right? So 7. With respect to w1, so Again, I need all this stuff. So let's compare these two. How do they differ? They are basically the same, but we need to multiply at the end with 1. So let's copy it. So it's, or let's be lazy. So this is the gradient of E with respect to W1, 
times that one transpose. And I put brackets here so that it's kind of more obvious. OK? So what we are doing here is back propagation by hand. This was the forward propagation. And then we are going back through the operations. But the operations have a different taste to them, right? So before we were doing multiplication with W3. And now we are doing multiplication with W3 transpose. So starting from the residual, and then you're doing the transpose operation. And then there are some subtleties for your nonlinearities. It will be always the diagonal matrix of some expression, right? Why is the diagonal matrix? The diagonal matrix is there because it's a component-wise function. OK? So let me maybe stress that point. So suppose, more general, I'm, having, I'm defining some function f of a vector to be f of alpha 1 to f of alpha n. So this is a prototypical component-wise function. Now if I'm having the differential of f of alpha, and I know that is some g of alpha d alpha, OK, if this is the case, then I can also write down the d of df of my vector in this case to be diac g of v times dv. OK, that's a general pattern. Um, why? Because this diac construction is exactly the same as saying that g of v Hadamard product d of v. So that's just another implementation of the same expression. Why is it good as well? So you also see that the component-wise things are nice because you get a diagonal matrix. So what would, be, what would happen here if we wouldn't get a diagonal matrix? That would be really bad, right? It could be if we have com more complicated nonlinearities where we mix up components. In principle, we need the Jacobian of this expression. That would be a 1,000 by 1,000 dimensional matrix, which is super expensive to calculate. Right? And then the backward pass would be much more expensive than the forward pass, which is very bad. This diagonal matrix can be always implemented like that in code. So the memory requirement is never 1,000 squared. It will be only 1,000 times 1. Okay? That's why the component-wise thing is here, okay? because then the back propagation works nicely. OK, great. So far, so good. So let's see whether. This is similar. So this is a similar derivation, um, basically reading off the gradients for B3 and W3. Then comes now our tangent superbullicus, and here you have the derivation, hopefully without mistakes. OK? This is new slide, so please check it. And then there comes the vector version of it. You probably were surprised, wow, this professor is really good. He can derive all this just out of his sleeves only because I made the slides before, OK? I was, I was knowing. So when I made the slides, it took me quite a while to figure it out. So that's the normal case, OK, that it takes quite a while to figure it out, OK? But once you've done slides on that one, everything should be easy. So far, so good. Then we go on with B2, blah, blah, blah. And OK, luckily, I, here I put the dike in here. OK, that's good. But I forgot it on the board. and. Um, what was the other transpose sign? Oh, yeah, that was just because of the double mistake, right? So it was gone, so it's fine. And then we have the, the derivative with respect to w2. Let's check it. So that's the diag of 1 minus. Perfect. OK. And so on and so forth. I do it again and again. And it's all on the slides here, OK? And here I'm written out the expression, where now you see that the, this expression, oops, it's not so easy to mark. So the bluish expression is exactly the gradient with respect to B2, okay, just as it was on the board. So what remains to do? Maybe let's think about how we could compute it efficiently. So this is a summary of all the gradients. And if I format them slightly differently and put everything below each other, there you see that there's always a lot of things we can recycle. Yeah? We start with the residual. That is the derivative with respect to this one. And then we multiply from the right-hand side with the 
Z3, which was the output or the activation of the third layer. And then we take the R and multiply from the left with this expression, and so on and so forth. We can add another one. So now I also added the gradients with respect to Z4, Z3, and Z2. And there you see nicely the intermediate steps. Okay? You have the gradient with respect to Z4, which is R, and then for B3, you just read it off. For the other ones, you need to multiply it. Then you go one step further, and then multiply it from the left with Z1, and so on and so forth. Okay? So those are the steps. So now what remains to do? Implement it. So here's the implementation. Okay, so this is the backward computation that we've just seen. And here I'm using star star 2, which is like component-wise squaring. Okay? Um, also notice I'm not defining a diagonal matrix. I'm just using the vector Hadama product. Okay, so that's the one that is efficient then. Here I'm using the outer product function, right, which I think might be a bit better than taking a vector in NumPy at sign and then taking a transpose vector with transpose vectors. I don't know very well in NumPy how to do it right. Maybe one first need to convert it to a matrix or blah, blah, blah. So I think the NP outer is just fine. What can we do with our gradients? We can do gradient descent. Okay, so we have a learning rate and then we update our weights. Okay, and that's it. That's our first neural network. Um, there's a MATLAB version 2. This is now the same code in MATLAB, okay? But yeah, I don't know whether anyone u still uses MATLAB. Okay, so far so good. Any questions about that one? Yeah? So normally the input layer and the output layer don't have any activation function, right? Yes, yeah. Like only the, the hidden layer. The one yeah, yeah. But you can do yeah. for good reason. Or you can also make nonlinear functions if you are able to do the derivatives. So a transformer is a function that is more nonlinear than that one, right? So look at where get the components of x mixed with each other. They appear only in this operation here. I'm having a linear combination of the components, but I never multiply x1 with x2. I never do these things, okay? So I'm only having a linear operation, which is nice for derivatives. The only nonlinear operation is going component-wise, which leads to a very nice derivative that is quick and nice to compute. So the forward pass is as, as expensive as the backward pass. Yeah? So in the forward pass, you need to multiply with w1, w2, and so on. On the backward pass, I do it with the transpose one, but that's equally expensive. OK, so here's some more gradient descent. Let me show you some code. So this is the implementation of what we've just seen. And I'm using the digits. OK, here's the digit gallery, blah, blah, blah. So to look at them. So here's my implementation of the multi-layer neural network that we've just seen. So um, first of all here, I'm, I'm reading off the shape of my training data. And the images are 28 by 28, but they are vectorized into a long vector. So the D will be something like 784. I don't know. You can check it. I think the 4 is right at the end. OK? So this is D is 784 for the endless digits. And then I can choose some parameters. And you see good choice. Good choice means I spent a couple of hours playing around with them to find some good parameters. OK? They are never good at the beginning. So I show you in a second bad choices. And then here's some sizes of hidden layers. And why do I make them so small? Because it should run during the lecture. It should be super fast, OK? But the performance won't be very good. Then after having chosen the sizes, now I can define all my parameters. OK, the W1 is a random M1 by D matrix. The W2 is an M2 by M1 matrix, and so on and so forth. Then comes the code that we've seen on the board. So I'm iterating through my training set. I need to flatten the examples because it's an image, and I flatten it to a vector. So the flatten operation is basically the same as in math if we say vec of x train. Yeah, so that's the same thing, putting everything into a long column vector. Um, the targets have already the right format. Then comes the forward computation. So this is the code from the lecture. Then comes the backward computation. This is the code from the lecture. And then comes the gradient descent. Where gradient descent now means, OK, you want to minimize e, the gradient points towards the top of the hill, so go to the other direction. That's why there's a minus sign. 
And then after a while, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the error. And so let's execute this code again from the top here. And ideally, it will just run. And you see it's running. And it's going down quite quickly. We can also have more outputs here. So you see that it's going down. It's going down really fast. OK, now I didn't reset it. So let me reset it. And then let's run it again. And it's going, going down. But then after a while, it's not going down anymore. Let's see what's happening for bad choices. OK, let's say we take a much smaller learning rate. OK, let's try that one. So let's initialize again. And there you see now that the progress is much slower. Yeah? So it takes longer to go down. Yeah, it's, it's still here at 0 point something. And it's not going down so quickly, right? And it's really stochastic gradient descent. I'm really looking at a single training example and takes a gradient. And as you know, the gradient might be really off. It might be really wrong. That's why sometimes I'm just jumping from 9 to 40 again, OK? However, if I do it long enough, then it kind of averages out. So what's happening if my, train, my learning rate is too small? That's also good exercise or something practical that can happen. OK, that one is not yet large enough, so let's make it even larger. Let's say 1.0. By the way, some people then like to write this. Better be precise with writing floats or integers. You never know what the language makes out of this. OK. Oh, what's happening? It's still running here? Oh, it's still running. OK, now it's done. OK, so. And then you get nuns. Nuns meaning the whole thing explodes. And I can draw a picture for that one. Um, because it's, it's interesting, and it's something that typically happens in practice, that you need to fiddle around with the learning rate. So what shape does our loss function have? It's a parabola, OK? So it's really just such a simple function. You could say, oh, does it really, is it really so complicated to optimize that one? In 1D, it's not, but in high dimension, it is. Okay? In high dimension, it could be a very long salad dish, and you don't know where you are. You don't know in which direction the optimum is. So in high dimension, squared function is already quite challenging. So now, if my learning rate is just right, I jump right to the minimum, and that's it. And I'm done. And then maybe I'm jumping around a little bit, but that's it. If my learning rate is too small, I'm making steady progress and then I'm jumping like that. If my learning rate is too large, it might look like this. And everything is fine, OK? But I kind of jump too much. But if my learning rate is too large, then this will happen. And I jump out of the bowl. And then I have not a number, OK? So that's, that's the thing with the learning rate. Now, can you find the learning rate automatically? Yes, of course. You could calculate the Hessian of that one. And then you have a Newton method. This is gradient descent, which means, uh, for example, w is equal to wt plus 1 is wt minus eta. And then comes the gradient of my, um, my loss. This is the usual gradient one, but in a Newton method, you put here the Hessian matrix. Yeah? Where the Hessian of a matrix is, of course, a four-dimensional tensor, right? So it's a bit involved and maybe inverse or something. I think inverse. I also don't know it. If you choose the Hessian, then you have a Newton method and there's no learning rate. And if you calculate it, you will jump in one step to the optimum, OK? However, for neural networks, this is too hard to compute. But there are, there's a toolbox for PyTorch called Backpack for people in Tübingen. And they made a backpropagation for the Hessian as well, which is reasonably, uh, it's a good approximation to the real Hessian, yeah? And it's cheap to do. So it's something that people can try, OK? OK, so this is like why the learning rate is important. Um, the other consideration now is, so how good is it? OK, so let's see um, how good it is. Let's take the best parameters that I, that I had. My best choice, or a good choice, was 0 0.01. And let's run it. OK, 
Okay, here we go. And then what, we do, what we're going to do is now we calculate the so-called confusion matrix. So for that, I'm taking now my, my training data. In this case, I'm calculating the tra training error. I'm running it through my trained network. I don't update anymore. And then I'm having a matrix which has number of labels times number of labels. And I'm saying, OK, your true label was 1. What label did you get? OK, and I'm just counting. And when I do this, I get such a picture. <coughs> And you see, OK, the 0 was classified very well. The 1 was classified quite good. Sometimes it was an 8. OK? By the way, 8 is very popular. OK? The network is not very good. But there is some tendency to put some stuff on the diagonal. So the perfect confusion matrix is the perfect diagonal matrix in this case. You can also read it off from the training error. The training error is 65% wrong. Yeah? which is, uh, is not bad. Random guessing on 10 digits would be 90% wrong. Okay? So there is some learning happening here. Okay? However, this was the training error. As we know, in model selection, we should look at the test error. So we can run the same thing on the test set. And now this is very badly implemented with copy and paste, right? So if I have a bug in here, I need to change it in many locations. So never do it like this. Have functions for that one, right? So that everything only in one location. OK, on the test, it looks like it's generalizing. Yeah? So it has a similar performance, 66% error on the test set, which is quite OK. Yeah. And now, of course, we can now increase the number of layers, for example. So let's make this faster again by being less verbose. And I could now increase, let's say, OK, let's have 20 features before that one. And then I let it run. And let's calculate the confusion matrix. So what do we get? 78% errors, larger error. OK, didn't work out so well. And now you can fill around with it and fill around with the parameters, with the number of layers. And that's what people doing deep learning are doing. OK, yes? Could you determine the learning rate through cross-validation? Or would that be inefficient? So the learning rate should ensure that you should get quickly to a good solution, right? And you could say, OK, my budget is I let the machine run for one hour. And then I see what is the, the test error, for example. Now, you could do that, sure. Yeah. But there's no guarantee kind of thing, but it's more like this hand-wavy thing to do, right? So in general, in machine learning, everything is a bit hand-wavy, and partially we do it on the board with math, OK? But then when you do it with real data, there's a lot of trial and error, OK? Great, so that was our first neural network. And we really did it from scratch, which I think is a good Good learning experience here. Now, what is backpropagation? We haven't mentioned the we have mentioned the word, but what is it? Okay. So here's a short answer. The short this is the party answer of our t-shirts. So this is backward mode automatic differentiation. That's it. Okay. It's a well-known method. So let me click on this link here. So it's on this Wikipedia page on automatic differentiation. There's a subpoint called reverse mode. And reverse mode is just applying the chain rule. That's it. And um, as you can see here, backpropagation of errors in multilayer perceptron, a technique used in machine learning, is a special case of reverse mode AD. OK? So this is super well known. Um, already Zeppo Linnaima from Finland. So he wrote a paper in 1976 already on that one. So it's an old thing, this using the chain rule. Um, so here's a, an alternative an answer is a simple way to calculate derivatives yeah, that is like computationally efficient and quite clever. Um, one note, maybe for since we still have it on the board. Ah, OK. So we start with a vector, and then we're doing some matrix vector multiplication. How expensive is it? Let's say they are like n squared matrices, and it's like n squared to do this, right? So the forward pass costs like n squared steps because of the matrices. And at the end, we have a scalar. Now, why is backward mode nice? Because when we go backwards, yeah, we are kind of chaining. Um, the last operation is a vector, and we are chaining all these matrices on top of it. So this is the starting derivative. And actually, the very start is a single one. That is the derivative of the error with respect to itself is equal to 1. Okay. And then we are multiplying it with some matrices. By the way, that, uh, let me take better chalk. So 
the first derivative that we start with is the 1. Okay, and that is really the gradient of E with respect to itself. And this is a 1 by 1 matrix, 1 by 1, and this is in a 1 by n matri matrix, basically. So this is the first Jacobian, and then we multiply all the Jacobians along the way. And the nice thing is we are doing vector times matrix, and we get a vector. And again, vector times matrix. That's backward mode. That's why backward mode is good. Forward mode would mean we are multiplying from the left to the right. So we start with the matrix, we multiply it with the matrix, and this is n cube. So this is much more expensive. So forward mode would be possible too, and it's easier to implement in a toolbox, but it's much more expensive in, in this context. The curious thing is that, in my experience, running backward mode is as expensive as having a single forward pass through your network. And that is super fast, because it's surprising that you have a, a computer program like that one, and the forward evaluation, which is really eval, if you know what this is, right? So the eval function in Haskell or whatever, so the one that is evaluating an expression, that is the forward. And the surprising thing is that you can also have another one, eval gradient, which backwards computes a program. It's going backwards through a program. And it costs as much as that one. So basically, essentially, if your functions are all well behaved, you get the result and you get the gradient for free, okay? which is very nice. And that's the basis for deep learning, in a way. OK, let's look at another. We look at some more examples. And it's different ways to present it. OK, so let's look at another simplified neural network with fewer parameters. And everything is scalar. Yeah, let's say the y is a scalar. The w3 is not a matrix. It's a scalar. OK, and everything are scalars here. The input is also a scalar. OK, and then let's do again some similar tricks as we've just seen. So we have a single data point, x and t. And we have a loss function, which is also a scalar. Everything is a scalar here. Here now, our goal is to minimize the loss with respect to our three scalars. Great. And now, backpropagation is an efficient way to calculate these three derivatives. Yeah? Where node, so the w1 is a scalar. So this is really a partial derivative, like you know it from MAFI 3, MAFI 4, MAFI 5, that you should have heard, but which is about multivariate functions and multivariate derivatives and Jacobians and Hessians and all of these things. Don't worry if you haven't heard it. Check out the Wikipedia page. Then you already know already something, OK? So you, the thing is, during your studies, usually you will see, oh, I missed that one. I don't have this background. You learn some of the backgrounds, and the rest you need to learn yourself. And that's the normal thing. So these three derivatives are really just scalars. So everything from the notation is fine, right? If that would be a vector, it's getting starting to be fishy, and maybe it would be a matrix or something. But those are just these ones. Let's rewrite our network again into layers, OK? Similarly, as we did on the board. And we could also draw a computational graph, OK? And this is now a graph which explains what computations we are doing. So we start with x, and then we evaluate f1 where f1 takes w1 and x. OK, so that is the first. And the result of that one gets passed to f2 and combined with w2, and so on and so forth. At the end, we have a loss. And this is a graph that some, it could have cycles also. In Haskell, it can have cycles, or in other languages, like with, recursi with recursion. But this is like a very good visualization of a computation. So let's look at the forward pass. The forward pass calculating z2. And now this is a nice notation, which I got from some Stanford class on deep learning, which we will do, by the way, next semester for bachelor students, possibly. Maybe you're interested. Um, but with these lectures, you're already well prepared. So it's basically something very similar. So the notation is that we put the result of our computation here on top. And here we give it a nice color green. Okay. Next, we calculate z3. Next, we calculate z4. And then we calculate the loss. Now comes the interesting thing. Let's do the backward pass, the back propagation. Here we start with the derivative of e with respect to itself, which is equal to 1. Okay? And then we calculate the derivative of z4, 
uh, with respect to Z4, which is now basically because of the loss a bit complicated, but it's just Z4 minus t times my initial derivative here. Okay? And that's good. Now I'm already here. Now I'm moving this information down to here. So I'm calculating the derivative of e with respect to w3. And how am I doing it? I'm using the chain rule. And the chain rule here um, is, looks very simple. You can just cancel out these partials. Okay? And I guess you learned the chain rule differently in school. I guess you learned it in a way that I learned it. So you have a function f of g of x, right? And you want to calculate the derivative of that one. So you say h of x is that one. And then you would say, OK, the derivative is the derivative of the outer function evaluated at the normal location times the derivative of the inner function, right? So that's how you learned it in school. So there's an easier one, which is using this partial notation. So this is the derivative we are interested in. And we could be verbose and say, and we have a certain input, where the certain input could be, for example, x sub 0 or something else. OK? Let's omit that one. Now, basically, what we are doing is <coughs> we are taking the derivative. Uh, let's put it in here as well. So let's say this is all x0. And then we will get rid of it. So we evaluate it at a certain location, x0. Let's use this partial notation now for this expression, which is f prime is the partial of f with respect to its input. So it's partial of f with respect to, let's call it y. OK? Evaluated at the location y, fine. And then we have basically the y and taking the partial with respect to x, evaluated at x0. OK? And now let's make it nicer. Let's get rid of the inputs here. And then you see the chain rule is really just extending this fraction with the 1. And we can make it even nicer by saying, so this is now g. So it's a partial with respect to f with respect to g, which is the input to f, and g with respect to the x. OK, this is a, nicer, a very nice notation for the chain rule. In particular, if we have several functions like nested, you just put them all in a row. And these and these are exactly all these intermediate results. So we did just the chain rule over there. So here we see that now we have computed the 1. Fine, that's easy. Then there's a formula for calculating the derivative of the error with respect to z4, which is just the output, is just y. OK, fine. And then we can use z1 yeah, and multiplying it with the derivative of z4 with respect to w3, which is something that is really local here to f3. Okay, because the z4 was computed with f3. So we know everything about it. And this is giving us this derivative over here. Next one, we can also compute the one over there by multiplying our input derivative that comes like from the upstream with something local, again, with the derivative of z4 with respect to z3. Okay? And so on and so forth. And by this, we can compute all derivatives. And let's do this again. So we have a forward pass, bam, 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 bam. And then we have a backward pass where we compute all these derivatives and update the weights. Okay? So this is a cartoon of what's happening here. So far, so good? Kind of. For scalars, the notation is easy, right? Everything is good. For scalars and vectors, it's getting more dangerous here because now the e might be a scalar, it's an error, but let's say the x is a vector. Yeah, then this object here is the Jacobian, which is now a 1 times n matrix. Similarly, the e with respect to y will be a 1 times m matrix, and the y with respect to x is an m times n matrix, because the y is m-dimensional. 
Okay, so here you have to be careful that you have the right ordering, and then everything is fine. And that's basically what we did on the board. So those were Jacobian matrices, and we wrote it in a nice fashion that everything is okay. However, once you have now matrices, then it gets dangerous, because now this object here is actually an m times m times n thing, right? Or if you use the matrix differential calculus, you would um, say the matrix W is, you vectorize it and put it into a long vector. So that the Jacobian always have, the rows is the number of outputs, the column is the number of inputs, or the other way around, okay? But notation is not so easy here. Yes? Over here. Ah, okay. Yes, I um, basically. Yeah. I, yeah, I see what you're saying. Ah, okay. So maybe my explanation is not so great yet here. Ah, it's also not better. I see what you're saying. If I cancel it, it should be an H over here, right? But the H is processing the X immediately. So there's a, there's a problem here with the notation. Um, so let's rewrite this thing up here as a little computer program, okay? So let's say um, uh, we say we start with the x, okay, fine. And then we say g is equal to g of x and f is equal to f of g. And then I think I could write it like this, that the derivative of f of this expression with respect to x is in this product. Okay, yeah, so uh, this notation is strange, right? The g is a constant in a way and the function. However, that's how we compute things typically. Of course, I could give this other names here or something and then everything is okay, yeah. Just uh, the thing is the, in the, the intuition behind the chain rule is really simple. You have the output and the input, and you introduce an intermediate result. And then you can say, okay, the output with respect to the intermediate result, and the intermediate result with respect to the input. Yeah? But uh, yeah, it was kind of wrong. Yeah, I agree. Now it's better. Okay, now you see also the reason why I stress these are all scalars. These are all scalars. Everything is fine here, so there's no problem with dimensionality. But once you get to more complicated things, you cannot make these nice, com the, the chain rule is not so nice anymore. You can do it for the scalars and vectors, but you can't do it for the matrices. But the matrices are essential for the backpropagation. Let's look at yet another backpropagation example. Yeah? Now from the Stanford course on deep neural networks for computer vision from Fai Fai Lee, Justin Johnson, Serena Young, I think these slides have been also designed from Andrei Karpati partially, I guess. So I asked them whether I can use them, and they said, yes, no problem, you can use them. So here they are, and you can see it with this yellow bar here, okay, that I copied the slides. So here's another example, and this is a really nice illustration, and my presentation is, uh, is really motivated by theirs. So they view it now not in the context of neural networks, actually, but they say, suppose you have any function, f of x, comma y, comma z. For example, x plus y times z. Let's plug in some values, okay? So you plug in these values, and they use the same, not because they do it as I do, but the reason is I did it as they do. So that's why I had green and red. So we can put the value minus two and five here, and then my computational graph, or your eval function from your fancy programming language calculates the three. Great, and here we have a minus four, and we compute a minus 12. For a neural network, that might be the input, some bias, maybe some matrix, and this might be the error, or some intermediate result. Now let's calculate the derivatives for that one. Um, let's give intermediate results names. So this intermediate result is now called Q, which is x plus y, and we can also calculate these partial derivatives, which are trivial in this case, right? So it's just dq by dx is one. And similarly over there. And then the result at the end can now be written as Q times z. 
OK, where now the derivatives are just the other factor. So far, so good. Let's calculate the derivatives of the inputs. We start with the derivative of f with its respect, uh, respect to itself, which is 1. That's always the start point. Next, we can calculate the derivative of f with respect to z. And for z1, um, we are basically using now the formula. We can read it off from here. So df by dz is equal to q. OK, the q was equal to 3, so I can copy it down here. Yeah. So that's where we can read it off. Our next one, with respect to um, q, it is z. And the z is minus 4. It's a green value. So I get a minus 4 over here. OK, so far, so good. Then the next one, so now what do I have to do here? Now I have to use the chain rule. OK, and I use the derivative of q with respect to y and f with respect to q. So where is f with respect to q? What is it? Does anyone know what the derivative of f with respect to q is? You can just yell it. It's what? Z? Yeah, yeah, it's z. So it's this minus 4. So it's this red value here. Oops, this red value is the derivative. Whatever number there is, minus 4. So it's minus 4 times the derivative of q with respect to y, which is 1. So that's how we get the minus 4. And similarly here, I get a minus 4, again, minus 4 times 1. OK, and here you see nicely in the cartoon how to compute it, like step by step. So 1 was the forward pass, then comes the backward pass. So zoom into one of the nodes in a bigger network. Yeah, In a forward pass, we take an x and a y, and we compute f of x, y to get the z. OK. However, we also have the local gradients here. And the local gradients are the output with respect to each of the inputs. And they can be already, I know a formula for them. I can implement them locally. So you like opt object-oriented programming? Great. Let's have an object for each of the layers, for each of the functions, for everything that can be done. And each object needs to know how to compute the forward pass. And each object needs to know how to compute the backward pass. For example, the tongue and superbolicus one, it knows how to do it forwardly. And it knows everything. If there's coming something from the outside a gradient, it multiplies it with 1 minus tongue and superbolicus squared of the input. OK? So now comes the gradient from the upstream. Yeah? Somewhere from the error, there comes the gradient in. It will have the same shape as z. OK? We can combine it with the local gradient with respect to x to get the loss with respect to x. And we can combine it with the local gradient with respect to y. And we pass on these red boxes to the other nodes. And there you see it can be nicely implemented like locally, the right, this operation. So you need to implement a forward operation and a backward operation. The forward operation takes the inputs and provides an output. The backward operation takes a gradient from upstream, and it pushes back two gradients to all its inputs, and so on and so forth. Here's a more involved example. Let's try to understand Z12. So this is actually a little neural network, right? So it's a sigmoidal function. And in here, we have some linear function with a bias. OK? So this is a computational graph. And actually, you only start with the numbers in front. And all the green ones are computed. OK? Suppose we did the forward pass. Let's start with the 1.0 at the end. And let's have our formulas ready okay, to do the backward pass. So 1 divided by x. OK, interesting. So we take the derivative that comes from the upstream, which is equal to 1. And we need to multiply it with the local derivative, which is minus 1 divided by x squared. OK, so let's see whether this is true. Let's, so where's my calculator? Oh, yeah, here I can calculate. So now, if the formula is right, I say minus 1 divided by 1.37. OK, does it compute this? Why doesn't it work? Oh, OK, whatever. Minus 0, 0.72, OK? And luckily, it is something else. So we did something wrong. Whew. Ah, OK. I did the mistake. I need to plug in the x. OK, great. OK, the x is 1.37. 
and I need to plug that one into my formula, and then I get minus 0 0.53. Okay, I think the last time I presented this, I did it right. Okay, so it's a bit subtle. Let's jump back. So to calculate, here's a derivative. I need to multiply the incoming derivative with the local derivative. The local derivative is minus 1 divided by x squared. What is the x? The x is the input to my node. It's 1.37. Okay, let's try the next one, okay? So the next one is simpler. It's the constant plus x. The derivative is 1. So the incoming derivative is minus 0 0.53 times 1, and it should be the same number. Okay, lucky me. This time I was right. Exponential function. Next one. So here's my derivative. It's e to the x, the local derivative. So I get minus 0 0.53 times e to the x. So what is e to the x? e to the x is 0 0.37, right? So that is the output of this node, yeah? So it should be, now let me try this trick again, 0 0.37. So why does it, oh, maybe this works, 0 0.37? No, it's also not working, or oh, whatever. Okay, let's use this super calculator here. So um, this is really a waste of resources. I feel very sorry. So it's the output times the incoming derivative times minus 0 0.53, something like that. Is that right? Let's hope for the best. Minus 0 0.19. OK, let's check it. OK, close. OK, so that's, I accept that as a yes. That was correct. OK, when you go through the slides yourself, do the same calculations before looking what's right, right? Use it as an exercise and fail, right? When you fail, then you learn something, okay? Okay, times minus one, okay, fine, that's just changing the sign. Now comes something interesting, the plus. So the plus basically now distributes what we have here. So basically we have a local gradient, which is constant one, in this case, times the 0 0.2, so it's just distributing the gradient along those two branches. And yet another one. Now comes the times. The times is the local gradient is just the other number. So for the top one, I need to multiply the 0 0.2 with 0 0.4. I think so. Ah, no, with the minus one. Okay, that's why I'm getting a minus 0 0.2. And for the bottom one, I need to multiply the 0 0.2 with the value w2 times 2. That's why I get the 0 0.40 and so on and so forth, down here as well. So now we know already that the sigmoid function has a nice derivative, okay? So we can also have a macro for this gate. So instead of doing it step by step, I could also take the output value over here and just say 0 0.73 one times 1 minus 0 0.73 is this gradient. Ah, here's another mistake from the lecture of today. So many mistakes. So the derivative of that one, I think I said it's 1 minus sigma of alpha, right? So this is only partially right. So it's times sigma of alpha. So that is the correct one. And you can try to interpret it in the diagram yourself, what it graphically means. OK, so if I have a more complicated operation and I know the derivative, I can also use it directly. OK, great. So far, so good. Um, there are certain patterns in here which are curious. So there's the maximum gate, for example, just taking the maximum one. And when you look at what's happening for the, for the back propagation, it's kind of routing yeah, this 2.0 gradient to one of the inputs. The other ones get 0 which kind of makes sense, right? Because the question is, so what produced this big change here? Yeah? The bottom one, not at all, but only the top one. So only the top one is relevant, right? I'm asking here, so how do I need to tweak the parameters to further increase the error? Or if I say minus, decrease the error, OK? And then basically, the bottom one is irrelevant because it wasn't chosen with the maximum. I've chosen only the top one, OK? Then there's, so it's a router type of thing. The multiplication thing is a switcher, right? So it's kind of switching these things. And I don't know, those are just patterns that you can use when you do it by hand, OK? OK, so far so good. Let's say we have a more complicated network. Some networks, 
they have an output and then they put it into different locations, right? It could be anything. The gradients then have to be added. So if this node now receives two gradients, just sum them up and then you go on with your local gradient. Okay? So far so good. Now we can also do the whole thing vectorized. And maybe that's now too much for our brain, okay? Let's continue at this location next time. Um, just to show you what we've seen, so we've seen today first the detailed derivation of our first neural network, and I think it's good to do it by hand, and then you see the patterns. Yeah, where with patterns I mean this table over here. You see the different patterns that you are basically reusing the stuff all the time, so you can be very clever with the computation and you give names to the intermediate results, and then everything gets nicer, okay? Then it's good to have an implementation and to try it. The other thing I wanted to show you was like this little cartoon, which kind of shows you in what order now are you doing the different operations. Forward pass, backward pass, okay? And finally, it's a very general concept. You can apply it to any computational graph, okay? So it's not limited to this simple operations. Here's a more complicated example. Let's say you have a 3D model of some animation movie, okay? And then you use Blender. I don't know, do you know Blender? So Blender can be used to translate 3D objects into a 2D projection, and then you can get rich by showing it in the cinema, the movie, your great story. Now, suppose I'm taking a 2D image, and I want to infer the parameters of the 3D model, right? If I can not only forward compute through the Blender code, but if I can also backward compute through the Blender code, then I can find out the parameters that have been used to generate the image, okay? So let's say we are a bit less advantageous. Let's say we have already the 3D objects, but you want to estimate some hyperparameters, so for nice grass movement or for whatever, water surfaces or something, and you have a real video of something like that, in principle, you can backpropagate through the whole Blender code if you have this gradient eval function. And you can automatically set up the parameters, okay? Conceptually, I think for Blender you can't do it, but in principle, that is deep learning. Yeah? So that is like a new way to, to find out things. Okay, and then we looked at the Stanford simple example here of them, which is nicely worked out. And next time, we will look at the same thing, but with a vectorized notation. So we go through uh, this slide and go through all the details, yeah? And then you've seen four different versions of backpropagation, and I think then you really know what it is, okay? So thanks for your attention. I see you next week in, in Zoom, I think, right? Okay, thanks for your attention, and bye-bye.